Romans 8, verses 16 to 30. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, in, as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good both for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Had us start all the way back in verse 16, uh, which we looked at a few weeks ago now, even as we contemplate just three verses this morning, uh, beginning in verse 28. And just in case I I get your hopes up too much, these are very dense verses. So, we're going to be talking about this because the purpose of these dense theological statements in verses 28 to 30 are grounded in the shocking statement of condition in verse 17. This is a a central verse to Romans chapter 8, that only those who suffer with Christ will be glorified with Him. Now, throughout the rest of the, the chapter, Paul reminds us that we should take heart in the midst of suffering. Not only does the glorious end completely overshadow the present trials so that it is not worth comparing, but even now we have a powerful advocate who intercedes for us with the Father, with perfect perpetual prayers on our behalf. And so believers can be filled with hope because the Spirit prays according to the will of God and His requests are always answered affirmatively. The succeeding verses reveal that the central goal of the Spirit's prayers is that Christians will be conformed to the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And so this completes the logic of Romans chapter 8. Those who have the Spirit, verse 4, will walk according to the Spirit. They will, verse 5, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. They will, verse 13, put to death the deeds of the body and live. Verse 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, if if the spirit of God himself prays that you and I will be conformed to the image of Christ, and the Father, verse 27, who knows what is the mind of the Spirit, has determined, verse 28, to work together with the Spirit to work all things towards this good, we know 
verse 29, that we will be conformed to the image of His Son because God has predestined it. And verse 30, those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What an incredible hope we have then in the midst of requisite suffering. That we know that if we suffer for the sake of Christ, we can be confident that the calling, election, and both present and eternal inheritance of glory is also ours in Christ Jesus. So suffering for the Christian is is not a time uh, for mourning always, but is also a time of celebration. Even as the apostles, when they are arrested and beaten for the faith, they rejoiced because this confirmed their calling and election. It made them know, we will be glorified because they suffered with Christ. And so it begins, Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Now, these are dense statements. First off, when you read our translation carefully, you could easily take all things to be the subject of the sentence and that it is all things that are working together for good. But in the Greek, it's more specific in that it is God who is working together with something. Now, it could be saying that God is working together with all things to bring about good, but the context of verse 26 and 27 and the Holy Spirit's intercession on the behalf of believers, praying these perfect prayers continually on our behalf, suggests that it is still the Holy Spirit in view here. And and hence, God works with the Spirit in everything for the good of God's people. The the work of Christ and the, the fact that believers are in Christ Jesus has been mentioned six times already in this chapter, and now the collaboration of God the Father and God the Spirit is also included explicitly in the matter of intercession for believers in verses 26 and 27 which results in the promise of verse 28, where God the Father and the Spirit are working together in tandem for the good of believers. And so, the the purpose together of God the Father and God the Spirit is to conform believers to the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. That is explicitly the good that God seeks uh, for those who love Him. And it is their ultimate glory. Now, now this does not mean that everything which happens to us is good in and of itself. Suffering is not good. Physical or emotional pain is not good. Suffering is a tragic evil. I'm not supposed to say to another believer who is suffering, rejoice, this is wonderful. Uh, What a benefit you are now experiencing because it's working for your good. We do not praise God for the presence of suffering, especially in the case of other people. I don't thank God that bad things are happening to you. But if I see another believer suffering, I must do everything in my power to alleviate that suffering. There are religions that believe that suffering is good for you, and therefore, if I cause your suffering or am I indifferent towards your suffering, that's a good thing. Because, I mean, you will be reborn as something better next time. But in Christianity, although we believe that God is working all things for good, we do not believe that these things are good. We do not believe that people suffering is a good thing, and so therefore if I cause your suffering or am indifferent to your suffering, that's okay. We are called to care for one another in our suffering, to alleviate suffering. It's not as though all things are good or pleasant. But instead, the promise is that the most agonizing sufferings and evils inflicted on believers will be turned to their good by God. As Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 50 verse 20, after they had sold him as a slave to Israel's enemies, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God did no evil against Joseph. Joseph. 
But even as his brothers conspired evil and committed evil against him, God allowed them to succeed only so far as it served Joseph's good and God's glory. God redeems the evil that befalls us. He can take the most hopeless, painful situation and bring tremendous good out of it. And this is why we can rejoice in trials. They are not purposeless suffering. Instead, they are often God's perfect tool for accomplishing God's perfect purposes. Now, the context here in Romans 8 does definitely focus on sufferings and tribulations because that's what's already been brought up. But the all-encompassing character of the term all should not be ignored. All things are working together for good for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. All three persons of the triune God are working together so that all things will make us more like Jesus so that we will ultimately be glorified with Him. This is the good that is promised to us. You and I, we don't know the outcome of present circumstances. We don't know how things will work out, but God does. He knows exactly what will work to our ultimate benefit and only allows those things to happen. But notice the caveat. It is not for all people that God promises to work all things for good. It is not for all those who claim to be a Christian. It is not for all those who pray to God. Paul says that all things work together for good for those who love God And those who love God is defined in part as those who are called according to His purpose. This last phrase is a clarification so that believers can accurately locate the roots of our love for God. The believer's love for God is ultimately due to God's purpose in calling them to salvation. 1 John 4.19 tells us we love because He first loved us. The intention and purpose of God overshadows the personal choice of human beings so that all human merit is ruled out. As Paul confirms elsewhere, the election, predestination, and calling of believers is all according to God's purpose. So Paul's taking us back to the foundational truth that God saves people for a reason. More than just saving them from eternity in hell, God is making a new people who are devoted to Him in their everyday lives, people who love God. Not only is this an important mark of true believers, but this is an expression that is meant to connect the New Testament believers to the people of God throughout the Old Testament, where this is a common designation for the faithful in Israel. And this designation, those who love God, now applies to New Testament believers, both Jews and Gentiles, all those who are called, those who love and obey, Deuteronomy 7, 9, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. So those who love God, Jesus defines as those who obey His commandments. First John tells us over and over again, those who love God, obey His commandments. So th- those who love God is defined here as those who have been saved for a purpose. The purpose to what? Obey Him. To be conformed to the image of His Son. They, the predestination we'll see later is not just predestination for salvation, but predestination to be conformed to the image of Christ, to grow in our obedience, to be sanctified. Being called according to God's purpose must be understood here as an effectual call. This is not merely an invitation that human beings can reject because it summons them and overcomes human resistance and effectually persuades them to say yes to God. And you might think that that's a bold statement, but this has to be the case because verse 30 tells us that those whom He called, He also justified. Not that some of those called were eventually justified, but here it fuses the called and the justified together so that all those who are called in this way receive the blessing of justification. And if all those who are called are also justified, made righteous, then the calling must be effectual and must create faith 
for all those who are called are justified, and justification, the Bible teaches us, cannot occur without faith. And so this is the calling that grants us faith. One of my favorite theologians, Tom Schreiner, writes, the foundational reason why all things work for believers good begins to emerge. God's unstoppable purpose in calling believers to salvation cannot be frustrated, and thus He employs all things to bring about the plan He had from the very beginning in the lives of believers. And so we are introduced this morning to what theologians refer to as the golden chain of salvation, or if you're really fancy, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. But as we will see, the the calling of believers is not at the beginning of the chain, but at the center of it. God has already been working out His purposes of good for us well before we are even individually called, Romans 8, 29 to 30. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers." And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Catch the message of hope that Paul is trying to bring to his listeners. The good that is promised to all who love God, glorification with Christ, is a sure thing for those who also suffer with Him. This good is not due to fate or luck or even the moral superiority of believers. It is ascribed to God alone, to God's good and sovereign will, which has from eternity past to eternity future secured and guaranteed the good of those whom He has chosen. And thus, Paul can write Philippians 1.6, I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 or 23 and 24 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Such is our hope, church. He will surely do it. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. We can say these things with assurance because of this golden chain. The golden chain is not only vital in understanding the certainty of our hope in Christ despite all suffering, but it is the necessary logic for understanding that all of what God promises is true. Even if, at first glance, it seems to be that there is some contradiction in the Bible, so that the Scripture can both teach, Ephesians 2.8, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. And Hebrews 12.14 commands us to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The apostles can both proclaim Acts 16.31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And Romans 2.6-7, he will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. We believe Acts 2.21, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that Jesus taught Matthew 10, 22, the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see, these things seem to have some contradiction. But all of Scripture can only be accurate and in agreement so long as the golden chain holds true. This is a vital piece of logic for holding to the inspiration and infallibility of the Bible. If you don't understand this golden chain, this logical framework that says that those whom God already knew, those whom God predestines, those whom God calls, those whom God justifies, and those whom God glorifies are all one and the same person, that each of these is so intrinsically connected to the other that none is happening without the other, and so we can say both the one who believes will be saved and one must endure to the end to be saved. 
And both can be true. It is important as we hold to the truth, the, the infallibility of the Bible. And so the golden chain begins, Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The first part is the trickiest bit because... Some have long argued that the verb, he foreknew, here should be defined only in terms of God's prescience or, or foreknowledge. That is, that God predestined salvation for those whom he saw in advance would choose to be a part of his adopted family. Uh, according to this understanding, predestination is not ultimately based on God's decision to save some, but instead, God has predestined to save those He foresaw would choose Him. That God looked down the corridors of time and saw who would choose Him and then pretended to have chosen them, such as in John fifteen sixteen, when Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Now, can you imagine Jesus saying such a thing? You did not choose me. Well, actually, you would have, but I saw it. But I jumped the gun and now chose you first based on your choice so that I could pretend it was my choice and not yours. Oh, and I saw that you would produce abiding fruit, so I pretended to decide that as well. Fortunately, we have much better options for interpretation, options that fit with what the rest of Scripture teaches. The Greek verb here translated for new can refer to any knowledge of something before the time specified. So it, it literally can be translated already new. So it can, it can mean to know ahead of time about an event that will happen. So I can say, I foreknew the surprise party because someone told me about it. Or I can even refer to knowing someone before the current interaction. So that if, if one of my relatives were to visit the church and you were to try to introduce us, I could say, I foreknew him. It means to know something ahead of the time. So we see this usage of the term in Scripture so that when speaking of the pre-existence of Christ, Peter writes, 1 Peter 1.20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Peter is not saying that someone had a prescient notion that Jesus would come into existence. That's, that's heresy. But he's saying that Jesus was already known. He existed before the foundation of the world, but was only now being made known to the believers for their sake. And to understand foreknown only as prescience would, as I said in this case, result in heresy. Paul also uses this term in Acts 26.5 when speaking about his reputation among the Jews. He says, they have known for a long time, it's the exact same uh, word foreknew, they foreknew if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest part of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Again, Paul does not mean that the Jews all had prescient knowledge, knowing through mystical foreknowledge that he would become a Pharisee, but he's saying that they already knew him before and knew that he was a Pharisee. So Paul, when he uses this term foreknew in Romans 8.29, he's not also talking about knowing something specific but unspoken, a thing about someone ahead of time, that they would choose God someday. That's not what it says. It doesn't say God foreknew this thing about them. It says God foreknew them. It speaks of God's prior relational commitment to certain people, the exact language used of Israel in Romans 11.2. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. That is, God already knew Israel. They were already His people. Now, to know someone meant a lot more back then than it does now. Consider Genesis 4.1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And Genesis 4.17 follows, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. So to, to know someone speaks of intimacy and relationship. This is why in Jeremiah 1.5, when God says to him, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, 
He isn't just alerting Jeremiah to his ability to know things ahead of time. He's not just saying, I knew everybody before they were born, because that's obviously true about a God who knows all things. He's, he's not just showing off his, his prescience to Jeremiah, but he's communicating that he had already chosen to have a unique relationship with him, which is confirmed as he continues, and before you were born, I consecrated you, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. All of this took place before Jeremiah was even born. God already knew him in the sense that he had relationship with him, chose to have relationship with him and consecrated him and appointed him as a prophet all before even his birth. The same kind of knowing is also said of Israel in Amos 3.2 when God says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. God isn't saying that he didn't know the other nations existed. He's saying that he has chosen this relationship with no other people besides Israel. And so Paul's own audience would think of Israel as the people God had foreknown and had chosen. And so his argument here was designed to show that God was so sovereign that he was not bound to choose with the regard to salvation based on Jewish ethnicity, but he had foreknown and chosen all who were now being filled with the Holy Spirit. These were already common words to speak of Israel, those who were foreknown by God, those who were chosen by God, those who were called by God. But now Paul's point is that this choosing and this foreknowledge is also for Gentile believers that are now being filled with the Holy Spirit. The point is that God has predestined those on whom He has set His covenant affection, those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. This is a regular question people often ask. It comes up a a lot here. Does the Bible really teach the doctrine of predestination? And our answer can only be emphatically, yes, of course the Bible teaches the doctrine of predestination. We can say it as dogmatically as we want because the assertion is indisputable. No one who has ever read the Bible could ever argue that the Bible has no doctrine of predestination. They may say that they don't believe in predestination, indeed many do not. But nobody would argue that the Bible does not have it because this is a silly argument. It's a futile argument. John Calvin, Martin Luther, and Augustine didn't invent predestination. It is a biblical term. And so the answer to the question, does the Bible teach predestination, is simple. But there's there's a less simple question. Not everybody agrees about what kind of predestination is in view. Biblical scholars and theologians throughout history have been sharply divided on this issue. As we have already explored with the term foreknew, there is a view common to the Roman Catholic Church and Methodists as well as Arminians, which is that prescient view of predestination, that view that God does not really predestine. Instead, He he looks down the corridors of time from His vantage point in eternity, and He sees the different responses people make to the gospel of Christ. And and then, on the basis of His prior knowledge of how we would respond freely to the invitation of the gospel, He he then only says that He has chosen us. In, In this view, God does not work the faith into their hearts. That is something people do by their response, by their will, by their choice. Now, Our answer to this view would be to say that foreknowledge or prescience is not an explanation of predestination, but is instead a denial of predestination, which is why you will find Christians who will freely admit that they don't believe in predestination, despite it being clearly stated in the Bible so many times. The Word has been explained away in in favor of a notion that the destiny of all people is determined only by the choices they make and not by any choice that God makes in advance. This, of course, does not jive at all with what Paul is teaching. Paul expresses here not some verbal mumbo-jumbo that ends up meaning nothing at all, but that God is gloriously bringing about His purposes for every genuine believer. Paul is expressing this incredible hope The God unfailingly works all things for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Do you see how, or the reason why so many people would like to divorce these these verses from each other? 
They would like to divorce the verse that says God's working all things for your good away from the verse, the, talk, the, the golden chain that says exactly what God's doing and how he's doing it because they don't want to have these things aligned. But they, they're connected. How is God bringing about good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Those he has called, he will also justify or has also justified. Those he has justified, he has also glorified. Paul uses the verb predestined when speaking of matters that God has predetermined. In Ephesians 1.5, he says that God predestined believers to be adopted as His children. In Ephesians 1.11 and 12, he teaches that believers are predestined to live for God's praise and glory. And here in Romans 8.29, Paul points out that God has predestined believers to be conformed to the image of His Son. This is the good for which all things are working in our lives. The purpose for which believers have been predestined to conformity with Christ is in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And the word firstborn could be taken literally as in the firstborn child in a family, but in the case of Jesus Christ, it speaks metaphorically of His preeminent status, as in Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It could also denote Christ's position as the first to experience resurrection from the dead, and both meanings are included in Colossians 1.18. And He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. It also uses the word many when speaking of the believers to signal that this transformation of believers is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant in which Abraham was promised, Romans 4.18, that he should become the father of many nations. And so now has been fulfilled that Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, in the Old Testament, Israel was God's firstborn, Exodus 4.22. But now we see that Jesus Christ is God's firstborn, the true and better Israel, and one becomes part of God's family only by union with Him. And this union happens explicitly through the transformation of believers so that they are conformed to Christ's image. This is what predestination is linked to here in our passage. In Ephesians, it was adoption. Here, it is linked to the sanctification of believers. So, it's not just the predetermination of who would be saved, but a predetermination of who would be sanctified, that part of salvation where we are growing in our faith, we are growing in our obedience, where God's chosen people are having their behavior conform to that of Christ Jesus. This, after all, is what the Spirit has been praying for. The chain continues, verse 30, and those whom He predestined, He also called, and those whom He called, He also justified, and those whom He justified, He also glorified. Called comes up again in three verses, this time at the center of the golden chain. Those God has already chosen to have a relationship with, those He has already predetermined that they will be conformed to the image of of His Son, these He has called through the gospel as an effectual summons to Himself. Do you see this? By the time someone is called, God has already done two things in this chain. He has already foreknown them, and He has already predestined that they will be sanctified. Think of the implications here. If you are called, if you become a Christian as you're called by the gospel, it means God has already determined that He will finish the work that He's begun in you. You will be conformed to the image of Christ. That is an incredible hope. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. 
To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. See how these are, are so interconnected again? You were called, why? So that you could obtain the glory. So that through sanctification and belief in the truth, you could obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we are called, we are also justified, that is, made righteous. This reverts to God's saving activity by which believers are declared to be right before a holy God. Every link in the chain is a necessary connection. If known, then predestined. If predestined, then called. If called, then justified. If justified, then glorified. Each activity in the unbreakable chain of events strongly emphasizes God's initiative. God is the one who has predestined us. God is the one who called us. God is the one who justified us. God not only sent Jesus to die for those who were still sinners, Romans 5.8, but also works out His entire plan for them, taking them from being His enemies to ultimately sharing in His glory, and all praise will go to God. So, Does Romans 8.30 guarantee that every person who is chosen by God, called and justified, will someday ultimately also be glorified? Yes, but perhaps not in the way we normally hear claimed in Reformed circles. Remember the context of Romans. Paul has been setting out his gospel as one that not only justifies, but it also sanctifies. It doesn't just initiate salvation. It doesn't just make us right with God at the beginning, but it also transforms our lives. It is a gospel which leads to the obedience of faith in every true believer, which results in the righteousness of God being displayed in this world through the lives that are increasingly righteous. It results in human beings who have been enslaved to sin all their lives, now being set free from sin and becoming slaves to righteousness. Or in the language of Romans 8, it results in people who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And thus Romans 8, 4, fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. But yet another way... It results in people who are being conformed to the image of God's Son, Romans 8.29. The golden chain of Romans 8 is the culmination of the entire message of Romans up until now. Without it, the logic of Romans doesn't make any sense. In fact, as we've seen, the logic of the Bible doesn't make any sense because so many things would be contradictory if the chain did not hold true. Now, preachers... And writers often paraphrase the golden chain as those whom God foreknew, He also called, and those whom He called, He also justified, and those who He justified, He will also glorify. What's the problem with that claim? It changes a past tense to become a future tense. It changes Paul's language completely. All of these things have the same verb tense all the way throughout. So the end of the golden chain says, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Will glorify is not the same as glorified. And the most natural way of reading Paul's words is to indicate that in each case, he is reminding us of something that God has already done for us. If God has foreknown you, called you, and justified you, He has already glorified you, at least to some degree. Now, this fits with Jesus' own claim, John 17, 22, that He had already shared His glory with His disciples. The glory that God had given to Him, He had already shared it. It also fits with 2 Corinthians 3, 17, and 18. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So, 
get me, it is not wrong to say that those whom God has justified will also be glorified. The ultimate glory, of course, will come when we are fully made like Christ. But in the context of Romans 8, along with 2 Corinthians 3, there is also glory being revealed now. And so in Romans 8.30, Paul is essentially saying, do you want proof that God has predestined those who embraced the gospel to be conformed to the image of His Son? Look at what He's doing already. Look at the proof right in front of you. Look at the lives of those whom God has called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Their lives are already different They've already begun being conformed to the image of God's Son. In this case, glory is also referring to sanctification because it's a process that's happening from one degree to the other as we become more and more like Christ. This is the good that all things are working out for, that you and I would be more and more conformed to the image of Christ, walking the way Jesus did. What a blessing. And the ultimate glory will be that we will fully walk as Jesus. We will fully bear His image. His glory will be completed in us as we walk according to the Spirit and are conformed to the image of God's Son. God has already begun the process of glorifying believers. Those whom God predestined, He also glorified. And you can see for yourselves what God has already done. Through believers, both Jewish and Gentile believers in the, in the Roman case, that they're more and more like Christ. Paul says everyone can see it, Romans 1.8. He says, already I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. And that glorious transformation from one degree of glory to another proves that God foreknew them and has now called them and has justified them. The glory, even in part, is the proof. Believers are assured that God works everything for good because the God who set His covenant love on them predestined them to be like His Son, called them effectually to Himself, and justified them, is glorifying them, and will certainly glorify them. All the sufferings and afflictions of our present day are not an obstacle to our ultimate salvation, but are the means by which God is accomplishing salvation in us. Let's pray. Father, we have an incredible task ahead of us, an impossible task, and that is to come to Your Word and understand it. And yet this impossible thing is something you promise to your people by the Holy Spirit. You promise that those who have dedicated themselves to obedience will understand your words. These are things that you have granted to us. And so, Lord, many have, in a sense, set most of the writings of the New Testament aside and said, well, these can't be understood. We can't know what these things mean. It, it's all a mystery. But God, we thank you that by your Spirit, we can know what it is that you're communicating to your church. And along with all the implications and, and the questions that something like predestination brings to us, Lord, I, I pray that the core message that Paul is getting across here would come through to us, that we have a sure hope that your work is already done, that what you have promised will come to fruition, and Lord, that it would cause us to go through whatever you have called us to for trials and tribulations and sufferings, to go through it well, to go through with joy and with hope and with a continuing faith, knowing that you are faithful. You will keep the plan that you have made before the foundations of the earth, you will surely do it. And so, Lord, may we praise you this morning all the more because you are a truth-telling God who calls the end from the beginning and tells us what will take place. And may we enjoy the peace and hope of that and give you praise for your awesome power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.